Hello everyone, I am Jason Thacker, Vice President and Chief Technology Architect of White Badger Group LLC, and one of the two inventors of our new Logic Chain Stateful Activity Whitelisting technology. Since that's a bit of a mouthful, we refer to it as Chainsaw. In this video, we'll be covering some of the technical aspects of how Chainsaw works and see a live working demonstration. Believe it or not, Chainsaw is not just a catchy name made up by our highly paid marketing consultants. Its components are actually a very complete description of the parts of the technology that make it so powerful and unique. It is also a fantastic place to start talking about exactly what it is and how it works. First, it is based on the idea of logic chains. These chains represent the realm of known and acceptable states of the systems that are to be protected, as well as the state's relationships with each other. These are implemented in what is known as a finite state machine and together mirror the functionality of the protected systems. Next, Chainsaw is stateful, meaning that it tracks state and only allows one state configuration to be active at any given time. It drives the state machine using live activity, which is typically captured from a network or other shared bus. Lastly, the whole system acts as a kind of dynamic whitelist, blocking or raising an alarm whenever it observes something that falls outside the states it is configured to recognize. Unlike a traditional whitelist in any offering currently on the market, Chainsaw is contextually aware and is able to detect issues not only in content, but also in order, timing, and combination with other systems. Chainsaw is a technology we developed to approach system security from an entirely different point of view and solve problems that simply can't be adequately addressed using current market offerings. For a thorough explanation of the problems we're aiming to solve, the applied benefits, and other less technical information, please watch our executive summary video by my noted colleague and co-inventor of this technology, Paul Williams, Chief Technology Officer of White Badger Group. As a brief primer on how stateful whitelisting can help solve a real-world problem, let's look at a scenario where other defenses tend to break down. Here we have a tank with a 500-gallon capacity. The tank is filled based on commands given by some external controller. So looking at an individual command that may be issued, a request could be made for 300 gallons to be added. This is perfectly fine in all ways as the tank has a 500-gallon capacity and 300 gallons is well within that. A potential problem comes when the command gets repeated erroneously. In analyzing the command, there's no way to detect an issue using classical analysis. The source and destination are the same as the first command and both valid. The command to fill is valid and the value of 300 gallons is also valid. However, the end result is obviously a catastrophic failure as the tank is now 100 gallons overfilled. In a scenario where the attack is malicious instead of accidental, the same command may be repeated indefinitely and not be caught. Chainsaw's stateful whitelisting solves this problem by being aware of the change in state after the first command is executed and would have flagged the subsequent commands as invalid. To really show the system's potential impact on the industry, we decided to build a demonstration system that shows how we can detect real attacks that would otherwise go unnoticed until it's too late. As such, our demonstration system is built around the common industrial process of filling and emptying a vessel. This process includes a pump, a vessel, and a pair of valves. Because we want to show that the technology is viable in a real-world environment, we also used common commercial hardware and software wherever possible. Looking at the demo system's construction, it is broken into a top and bottom half. On the top half is mounted a pair of valves, the pump, the vessel, in this case a balloon, a Phoenix Contact PLC, and the wiring necessary to connect everything. On the bottom half, we have a power supply, code assist controller, hand controls, an Ethernet hub, and of course, the WBG chainsaw. Taking a peek behind the curtain, let's look more closely at how things are connected and what's actually being done. The heavy lifting of device control is done by the Phoenix Contact Nanoline PLC, which uses its internal relay outputs to control power to the pump, valves, and running lamp. It also accepts the physical start and stop button inputs. This PLC is controlled directly over the network by Modbus commands from the code assist controller which runs the logic that drives everything. The logical flow configured for this system consists of six states, a cold stop, the filling of the vessel, a short hold, the emptying of the vessel, and another hold. Those four states run in a loop unless the shutdown process is triggered. The shutdown process effectively opens up the valves and allows for depressurization for 30 seconds, leaving the system in a safe cold stop state. There are three major subprocesses and trigger transitions here. The startup process, which transitions to the main loop process upon the press of the start button, and the shutdown process, which is triggered whenever the stop button is pressed during the main loop. So, now that you're acquainted with our miniature industrial facility, let's attack it. The attack itself is targeted at this specific plant configuration, 
but is extremely similar to the core functionality of the most advanced malware that has been successfully attacking IPC systems for years, the likes of Stuxnet, Flame, and others. These attacks take advantage of an unavoidable gap in IPC systems, which is that there is very little network visibility or control on the network between the HMIs, RTUs, and PLCs. Even other defenses that work in this space fall short in that they can only detect known attacks that match a certain very specific pattern. Potential defenses for this area are also very limited in that IPC networks are extremely inflexible due to the criticality of the processes they control, in addition to vendor lockdown and certification requirements. As we have seen in recent years, the current set of advanced malware is very capable of bypassing the best defenses, even jumping air gaps, being extremely targeted, and is able to make numerous transitions to get into even the deepest and most protected networks. Any security assessment of an IPC system, no matter how isolated or otherwise well protected, must make the assumption that an attacker will gain access to this part of the network eventually, whether their initial attack vector brought them in through an infected memory stick, engineer laptop, or deliberate infection. The end goal, however, tends to be the same target, which is that gap in the network defenses where IPC processes are the least protectable and where there is direct access to the field devices. Getting back to the demonstration, and this attack in particular, we've created two scenarios, neither of which is readily detectable using any security device or service currently available on the market. The first scenario is the injection of a Modbus command directly to a PLC that puts its outputs in an invalid configuration. None of the values being sent are invalid individually, but as a set, they place the PLC in a state that is not part of the original system design. The second attack is very similar, except that it puts the device in the exact same state as one of the parts of the main running loop, but it does so at the wrong time and in the wrong order. Let's focus on how the latter attack works for now. The devices used in this system are all connected to an Ethernet hub. In a real-world implementation on a switch network, the chainsaw device would be connected to a span port or a network tap. To begin the attack, our evil attacker gains access to the network and wants to overfill our vessel. To do that, he starts sending commands directly to the PLC, causing the pump to continuously run, the inlet valve to remain open, and the outlet valve to stay closed. As soon as the attack has any effect on the PLC state, an alarm is raised and one of two errors is reported. Either the state caused is completely invalid, or a valid state is occurring in the wrong context. This is all well and good, but how exactly did the detection occur and what triggered it? To understand that, let's look back at the logical flow of the system. Specifically, we're going to focus on the main running loop and ignore the rest for the moment. Because Chainsaw is able to see all sides of the communication that occur in this network, it is able to compare commands from both the attacker and the legitimate controller. As the attacker sends a stream of commands forcing the system to continue filling the vessel, Chainsaw performs an analysis of the current state and the traffic being observed. In state 1, the attacker's traffic matches the current state of the system. Because this has no effect on the actual state of the system, Chainsaw allows it, and the evil attacker believes his plan is working. However, as soon as the transition to state 2 is made by the legitimate controller, Chainsaw will flag the attacker's traffic as being invalid, because while the transition from state 1 to 2 was valid, observing commands identical to state 1 immediately after commands for state 2 is not. The same goes for states 3 and 4, and the attack is detected. Note that while this demonstration uses a stream of packets to make a point, detection happens on the first erroneous command which means it can and will sound the alarm if an attacker even attempts one packet's worth of an attack. When the attack is finished, Chainsaw will resynchronize with the monitor system after a short number of transitions, meaning it doesn't need to be reset after every detection event. This demonstration, while elegantly simple, does not adequately illustrate the ability of this technology to scale. By using a number of intertwined logic chains and many more devices, even the most minute issues affecting far-flung devices can be detected immediately. In many configurations, states of objects and systems can be tracked indirectly. For example, the 500 gallon water tank, discussed earlier, could be tracked by listening to the fill and empty commands without ever needing direct instrumentation reading the actual water level. Lastly, Chainsaw's ability to detect with an extremely high accuracy rate is unparalleled by itself, but the way it is implemented also allows for simpler static rules to be applied that cover source and destination addresses, command sets, and value ranges. So, you've seen Chainsaw in action. If you haven't seen our video detailing its strategic value, please take a moment and do so. That concludes this video. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions or other interest, please contact us using the information below.